Hey folks, Joseph Sabora here as we will continue with the most excellent franchise of all time, you know, Bill and Ted's. I'm about to review their first sequel of the series, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Yeah, which is part of the double feature pack right here with the first movie. The surprisingly successful hit of them all. Which surprisingly did do pretty well. I mean, it was a modest hit for this film. I mean, it's a story, once again, Bill and Ted are just getting ready to uh, perform their band, Wild Stylings, joining them with their princesses, you know, to be their backup as both drummer and keyboardists. But unfortunately, you know, they're having trouble because they sort of suck at times. But they're going to get better. <laughs> as Rufus puts it. Um, but this time, they're going to go through the journey of hell, as we know it. Once uh, Rufus's uh, former gym teacher, who was very evil, Chuck D. Namalas, who was played by Josh Acklin, as you may remember him as Huts in the Mighty Ducks movies, which, in turn, um, he was the villain in Lethal Weapon 2, um, which they're going to be sending out their evil replicas of Bill and Ted to have them execute the real uh, lives of them. And that's where they wound up meeting the Grim Reaper himself, Death, who's played by William Sadler. Yeah. And this was the movie I saw in theaters uh, at the Pacific Rock Sea Theater in Glendale, California, which is no longer around. Yeah, eventually became um, a performance arts theater, just like the Alex Theater. Um, but it's also for uh, dining as well. Quite different, too, because this is the theater that I actually shot while well, joining in with the Inclusion Films crew. We, we all worked together. Uh, we were doing the Through the Heart of Tango over there, same theater. But that's where I went to see movies uh, there, uh, such as the original Total Recall with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, I think I saw a hook over there, I'm not so sure. But I have seen several movies over there that was formerly operated by Pacific Theaters. Yeah. So it's uh, now, of course, beyond the star Palace, uh, which was Stars Feeder, and then now it's called Stars on Brand. So it has changed over the years. Um, anyway, um, surprisingly, it did um, have a modest success uh, when it came out in the summer of 1991, which was July 19, uh, just when Keanu Reeves was already doing yet another uh, summer hit with the original. Point Break, joining in with Patrick Swayze, so <laughs> what a year. Um, yeah, for its $20 million budget, yeah, this was going for a little bit of a higher budget than the first film, so it did actually make more, but it only made $38 million, uh, so it doubles it up. I mean, the, the first movie only made $40 million against its $6 million budget, but either way, um, this was actually the most uh, dark, twisted, uh, grim, um, and mostly the craziest sequel ever made. Like some, and it does get particularly mean-spirited at times. But at that point on, it's also hilarious. Just like the first movie. I mean, only this time, they kind of limited the, the time-traveling paradox. Um, only to focus more on both heaven and hell, and so on. I'm hoping they'll save um, the princesses, as well as the band, and, and the altered history. Yeah, that sort of thing. So, that way they can continue to go on with their next journeys as they follow. Um, but yeah, I will uh, continue to go on too. Um, with some more information. 
uh, after I just review the entire film. So here we go. Stars Keanu Reeves. You have Matrix, Speed, uh, River's Edge, John Wick films. You guessed it. Alex Winter. I already mentioned The Lost Boys. Uh, he was also in the movie um, called um, Grand Piano with Elijah Wood and John Cusack. Um, he was also in Death Wish Free and um, some others. Uh, William Sadler, who you may remember him as the villain in Die Hard 2, Die Harder. Uh, he also went on to do the film Rocket Man. Yeah. Josh Acklin. Yep. As I mentioned, from Lethal Weapon 2. Uh, the Mighty Ducks movies. And several, uh, several other cities he's been in. George Carlin, of course. Comedian. Was in Shining Time Station. He had his own show, too, uh, that aired on Fox. Um, lots of free seasons, I believe. But it was a great show. Uh, Pam, yeah, Pam Greer. As you may know, she was in several uh, black quotation movies that she's done, like Foxy Brown. Uh, she was also in movies like Above the Law, which was Steven Seagal's first film. Uh, she was even in the movie Jackie Brown, uh, that was a Quentin Tarantino movie. Uh, Mars Attacks, uh, Snow Day, every film. Uh, Chelsea Ross, who I believe uh, went on, who is best known for films uh, also from Above the Law, yeah, along with Major League, Hoosiers, and The Ballad of Buster Shrugs, even Basic Instincts. Uh, Annette uh, Akue, Sarah Trigger, yeah, they're replacing the original actresses. Hal Landon Jr., Amy Stock Quentin, Ed Gale, and Arturo Gale, Gale as Station, which at this point on, Tony Cox, uh, as you may know from Bad Santa, Friday, um, among many others. Yeah, um, he actually wore the suit. Uh, Tom Allard, Michael Chambers, aka Shrimp, uh, Bruno Falcon, aka Taco, Taj Mahal, and Frank Welker, the voice of God himself. <laughs> yep, it's written once again by Chris Matterson and Ed Solomon that's based on their characters. And it's directed by Pete Hewitt who took over for Stephen Herrick because he went on to do The Mighty Ducks. And for those who don't know, um, he's a British director who went on to do the 1997 version of The Bowers with John Goodman. Yes, and and Bradley Pierce, among, among other actors. I gotta review that someday too. The movie begins um, set in a utopian future society in San Dimas, California, where both teenagers, as we all know from the previous film, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, Billy S. Preston Esquire, and Ted Theodore Logan, both played by Alice Winter and Keanu Reeves, you know, already forming their band of Wild Silence, and now they're becoming more successful, bringing in the music revolution of the society. By 2691, we meet a former gym teacher turned out to be a terrorist named Chuck D. Lamalos, who's played by Josh Acklin, who attacks the Bill and Ted's university and steals the time traveling phone booth from Rufus, the citizen leadership from the previous film, played by George Carlin. His attempt was to alter the history that was foolish and frivolous, and setting out evil robot replicas of Bill and Ted. So they're going to be going back 
to the 20th century, which is 1991, to prevent the originals from winning the uh, upcoming Battle of the Bands competition, which at this rate, they're assigned to kill both Bill and Ted. But Rufus attempts to stop the Malos, and, but seemingly got lost somewhere in the circuits of time, or what it seems to be, because it might have been, as we know, a surprise twist. Well, we're going to, I guess that's what we're going to get to. Several years later, after their adventure for time, while Starlings have auditioned for, the, of course, the competition, Bill and Ted's uh, current girlfriends, um, which are both former 50th, 15th century princesses, you know, Joanna and Elizabeth, who are now played by new actresses, Annette um, Ascoy and Sarah Trigger, yeah, replacing the originals. So they have become skilled musicians. In fact, they probably play a lot better than they have, but hey, they do get better, as Rufus had put it out at the end of the movie, uh, the original, that is. Um, but therefore, you know, they're still having problems. You know, they still think they suck. You know, I, I know, almost as dim-witted as they were when they had trouble with their um, history assignment. Like, I kind know, of, when, when they always ask all these wrong questions. You know, like Joan of Arc is, you know, his wife, for instance. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Um, so, of course, you can't blame them. But despite of all that, um, an organizer named Mrs. Wardrobe, who's played by Pam Greer, asserts them to be in the slot of the contest, but as the final act, so they, they have to keep on practicing in order to get better. Um, little did we know, Bill and Ted, the evil uh, robots, as we all know, had came to their apartment just when already you know, the family are around, you know, they're at their apartments, and they're already planning on, you know, getting engaged to uh, Joanna and Elizabeth, and ready to be married someday. You know, things go a lot better. So yes, um, they came to their apartments um, after um, they just used the, the phone booth, going all the way down to Circle K, just so they can get ready for their assignment, and yeah, they found out about Rufus disappearing, so he only spotted the, the guitar that's uh, attached to the, the roof of the phone booth where the antenna is at. Um, again, they went to the apartment, uh, while both of them are all alone, you know, just watching an episode of Star Trek, which that kind of led to the story too, where an episode where Captain Kirk was stuck at the Vasquez Rocks and already going to get attacked. Well, that's exactly what happened in this movie. <laughs> that after their party that they have, um, the anyway they they took. Um, the real Bill and Ted all the way to Vasquez Rocks, planning to kill them by dropping them off of the cliff, and they just, uh, yeah, because they realize, you know, there are, are actual dicks, all right, and then, yes, they both spit their loogies at them, so now the real Bill and Ted were officially dead, but they woke up already looking pale, and blue, and then they spotted the Grim Reaper himself, Death, who was played by William Sadler. And yes, they actually Melbourne him, you know, giving him a wedgie. <laughs> yeah, just like how they did it with the Cowboys in the first movie. I forgot to mention that, but hey, it's Bill and Ted's adventure here. Um, but they unsuccessfully alert the, the police, which includes um, Ted's father, um, Captain Logan, who's played by Hal Linden Jr. Um, he was joined in with his partner, 
so I'm hoping that all the cops will understand that yes, both of them were murdered, and maybe they'll be able to find the killers are going after them, so be on the lookout, but of course they wouldn't believe them. Uh, therefore, yes, um, they're trying to stop the evil uh, robots themselves, but but now they're having a hard time you know, trying to trace their steps here. And not to mention, they, they were going to uh, Missy's apartment. Yeah, Missy, who just got married to uh, uh, Logan. Yeah, and of course, Missy played by Amy Stock of uh, Bolton. Yeah, he actually dumped um, her uh, husband, just for him, <laughs> of course. Um, so, uh, during um, this particular, um, I think it was a sleepover night, uh, they were just uh, playing a game where they're about to speak the, to the spirits, and that's where both Bill and Ted showed up, you know, trying to you know put it up in an act, on them and but all of a sudden they wound up going all the way down to a loophole and yeah they were falling all the way down and screaming <laughs> as long as they could and then they continued screaming until they stopped and they're like floating all the way down till they landed onto the spot and now you know that they're in hell they spotted of course Satan the devil <laughs> and then they wind up going straight to the gateway of hell and that's where they get to see their past lives you know as um, well both kids and teenagers uh, especially when we went inside Ted's uh, you know prevalent life you know, he was at the, the military academy in, in Alaska yeah, as we, we may already know when you heard it in, in the first one. Where you meet uh, Colonel Olds, played by Chelsea Ross. He was actually forcing both uh, Bill and Ted to do some push-ups because they couldn't uh, listen to what he says. You know. And then they're about to escape, only that both Bill and Ted were separated and once up in different um, gateways that they had to choose. Now, Bill went inside um, his granny's house because they're celebrating her birthday and of course granny is played also by Alex Winter with all that scary makeup that they have to give her and trying to make him look like uh, his granny and this is where Bill was being forced with a kiss and you can see that nasty teeth while Ted on the other hand wants up in the other uh, gate way where he begins to spot when he was a kid that he was terrorized by a deranged Easter bunny uh, just when he was about to grab the, the chocolates from the Easter basket so yes both Bill and Ted were chased down by their horrible memories during their childhood I mean before um, the you know they are already saying uh, nasty things to the devil and they had to have have them being pushed all the way back into the gateway until they're being chased down by a horse um, Bill's granny Ted's uh, evil Easter Bunny you know, the deranged one and of course Colonel Oates until he at, they both asked for you guessed it death to show up and they did so now um, and by the way it was actually called a science uh, yeah which was uh, where they had to speak the spirits so to death dismay uh, Bill and Ted selected modern games that they had to play in order to have them beat them which at that rate it turned out to be Battleship Clue, Electric Football, you know, NFL Super Bowl, and Twister. They all won the game, except for Def. <laughs> so now, because seeing that no one couldn't beat Def, I mean, both Bill and Ted were so lucky that 
by the end of it, uh, they reluctantly admit to defeat and place themselves at their command. So now they have to go all the way up to heaven to find Station. Yeah, they're an alien duo, which at this rate they had to, of course, uh, once up in disguises because they just mold uh, just uh, a couple right there. <laughs> So they had to go all the way up to God to explain. And they gave him a map. And then later they went on to find Station. Uh, yeah, was, stations, of course, was just plain charades <laughs> of certain movies. Yeah. Now, um, so their plan was to actually uh, get back to Earth. So that way they can build their good robot replicas of Bill and Ted, you know, themselves, by going to Builders Emporium in San Dimas to get all the equipment they need with uh, station already being put together into one, and you know, build all of them. So now they'll get ready to get to uh, San Dimas' Civic Auditorium for the Battle of the Bands. And at that rate, they'll finally get to stop um, both the evil Bill and Ted, which they just captured the princesses. And now they're up to them to rescue them. You know, already defeated the evil ones until these Malos had showed up. Of course, playing the time game and and also um, yeah, taking over this the live satellite broadcasts around the world. They finally stop them by playing the time game, as I mentioned. And then, yeah, they finally capture him and he got arrested. <laughs> got cuffed by Logan. So now, that's where we get to the twist where it turns out that Mrs. Wargrove is actually Rufus the whole time. So now, the band had finally came together, but they had to go back, <laughs> flash forward to their, old, to their adult years, so now they know that they play better, and that's exactly what they're going to do. Yeah, they, they cheat, but who cares? And they're going to rock better, and, and now we learn that they actually had uh, children. And I know this was a bit of a, a little bit of a controversy, thinking that, the kids that they have on their backs might either turn out to be sons or perhaps in the case of the third installment daughters well I know um but whatever the case I mean that's where they they want a rocking and they actually won the contest I believe which I know that's where we get to hear the song God gave rock Rock and Roll to You by Kiss. Uh, this was like the second verse of it. Um, yep, this one um, went to a whole uh, different pace um, compared to the original, but it's really, in my opinion, it's actually the best sequel we ever got. People may have their mixed reactions to it for those who've seen it, I mean, especially for those who actually saw it in theaters. I mean, some people say it's not exactly as good as the first one. Others say that that the movie's a lot better than the first one. Or at times they just, which I know I would be in part of it. It's I love both of them, and I agree. I mean, they all love both of them. I mean, to me, it's better off than just being just one movie at, at a time. Until so we got the third installment. Um, once again, it was great to see both uh, Reeves and Winter reprising their roles again. Because you know they had terrific chemistry. I wish um, Rufus was in the movie more. You know, George Carlin, of course. Because he's always been an, a funny comedian and an excellent actor, too. And I really miss him, too, since he passed away in, in 2008. You know. And this was his last film. Um, 
well, for the Bill and Ted uh, movie franchise, that if they had made the third installment in the 2000s, he would still be alive. But sadly, I, I guess that wasn't the case, because they weren't so sure. Um, but I gotta say, uh, the setting of the film really um, was very intriguing and very uh, grimy and, and dark and very twisted too. I mean, this is something that's that we've never seen before. Um, they had some great special effects that they had, all practical effects too. Uh, mostly for the, the Z design and everything. I was also told that um, by the time they were doing this movie, they were already working on another film, which that turned out to be Mom and Dad Save the World, so that's where some of the special effects and some of the settings uh, were set for it. Yeah, that, that explains it, because I can see the connection. Um, yeah, with the future uh, of, of what um, Bill and Ted had uh, joined in for their utopian future society. <laughs> um, there isn't enough time travel in the movie, so they mostly just focus on the journey of hell. So, yeah. Uh, back to uh, the characters, of course. Uh, I just said it uh, before, and I'll say it again. William Sadler as Death is the best thing about the movie. I mean, he's just so funny, hilarious. Um, and the fact that he became part of the band, which, which is a nice surprise, too, at the end. Yeah, get down with your bad self. Get down with your bad self. <laughs> and... Um, no, no, no matter what jokes he does, I mean, it's just, you know, you can tell he's just having a blast. I mean, <laughs> like, I, I know, no matter what he does, and you know, he's always getting beaten by Bill and Ted, like, and he tries to tell him about, I, I did most of the work, but they never cared. <laughs> yeah, so I guess he's basically... <laughs> in for the jokes. Um, well, and yeah, the um, the station is actually pretty cool too. I mean, it's an alien creature, but it's actually very cute. <laughs> and of course, they still do the air guitar riffs. And they say all these catchphrases, as, as we all know. Um, and, um, it's really cool. Um, this was a great follow-up to the movie. Of course, I love the moment when both Bill and Ted had possessed <laughs> his dad and his partner. <laughs> and I, I love how <laughs> he talks exactly like <laughs> his son. Like, when uh, Ted was, like, saying... Oh, he was possessing his father, just like The Exorcist, one and three. <laughs> Not two, because that movie sucked. He's like saying, I totally possessed my dad. <laughs> oh boy, that was just funny. Or when evil Bill and Ted, you know, were like trashing the entire room at their apartment, and the going around, you know, playing basketball, you know, with their heads and stuff, and then, then of course, you know, they're always checking on this Malos to see what they're doing for their plan. <laughs> you know, they, they actually watch straight from, you know, Ted's uh, visions for his eyes, and you just see Bill just, <laughs> just watching around. Um, <laughs> yeah, of course, they're made of metal and all. Um, also, they had to disguise their voices as the princesses, so they had them broke up. But, you know, they had to stay over at Missy's apartment, just for their safety. I mean, even when the evil Bill and Ted actually crashes in, they almost about to kill a cat. Yeah, that was like a running joke, too. Like, Which, I'm glad, though, because I don't want to see the cat getting run over. 
I mean, that's just fucking crazy. Back with the supporting cast, uh, with all these uh, great scenes. Um, I guess I also forgot to mention, they also have Primus. Uh, that was another uh, progressive rock uh, metal band that they had. and um, They had a lot of uh, great brands here, too. Um, because the soundtrack, uh, they actually had a lot of great songs, you know. I mentioned Kiss already. Um, but they're going for that spirit. Uh, there's even a bit of a, uh, a rock rap um, version uh, for the song, for the movie, which of course you just hear, you know, audio clips of the characters themselves. And yep, it, it did very well at the box office um, during the summer, even though Orion Pictures was struggling pretty hard, and, and Nelson, on the other hand, was already becoming the New Line Cinema. Um, I mean, they took over though. After a while. But either way, um, they even did a Marvel comic adaptation of the movie, too, and I couldn't believe it. I'm like, wow. Um, and yeah, it does play out like a spoof of The Seven Seal. Uh, that was a movie uh, that came out in 87 uh, from Sweden, so I think that's where they got the, the story. You know, having characters facing the Grim Reaper. Yeah, remember, don't fear the Reaper. <laughs> okay. Oh, actually, uh, I forgot, there's even a song by Megadeth, too, uh, called Go to Hell. Uh, there's even a quote about that, too, like, um, now that we're dead, um, you can have my Megadeth collection. Well, Ted, we're already dead. Okay, well, you can have it anyway. <laughs> or any of those other ones. And I know the original title was called Bill and Ted Go to Hell, but they had to do some changes. Uh, Pete Hewitt um, did a fascinating job um, with the direction. I mean, he really captures it. See, this was his first film that he ever did, mostly because he did a short film called, uh, um, I think, Candy Man or something like that. I don't know. But uh, he really captured it pretty well. I mean, the, the setting kind of feels more like something that Tim Burton could have directed, too. Yeah, and, and I could definitely see that. You know, how uh, eerie and, and creepy it looked. Anyway. <laughs> but either way, it's a, it's a very fun sequel. Um, going for the darker side. Uh, they're trying their best not to uh, replica the first movie. So that's for sure. Like, like they don't want to do like uh, the same old thing. They just want to make it different. Um, and yeah, I mean, think of it this way: they they were so popular that, of course, you know, they had to continue to go on with their journey. I also note that yes, by this period though, after the success of the film, that they actually had a Universal Studios uh, horror attraction for Bill and Ted's. Uh, for both Universal Studios Florida and Orlando, and of course Universal Studios Hollywood. They started in 1992, but in Hollywood they started in 97. Uh, they made a comeback in 2017, which that was the last one they ever had, so. Yeah, it's such a shame. But I almost wish I had seen it, though. Um, but either way, it's definitely non, 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 non heinous bogus journey that they had to go for <laughs> for the sequel. But it's still awesome. So, anyway, that's Bill and Ted's bogus journey, and I give the movie, I mean, even with a few flaws, it's okay. But I don't care. I'm still going to give it the same rating that I gave the first movie, five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and remember, 
be excellent to each other. And party on, dudes. And stay tuned for the third installment that I'm going to review later. So, catch you later, dudes.